Okay, all right. Welcome everyone to the weekly CDDRL seminar. Uh, we are very excited to have with us Marissa Kellum, who's a visiting scholar here, is unfortunately not here here, so she will be zooming in. But she's an associate professor of political science at Waseda University in Tokyo, Japan. Her research focuses on the quality of democracy in Latin America. And in her work, she links institutional analysis to governance outcomes in three ways. First, through political parties and coalitional politics. Second, through media freedom and democratic accountability. And finally, through populism and democratic backsliding. She has published across many peer-reviewed political science journals, um, received a PhD in political science from UCLA, spent a few years at Texas A&M before moving to Japan, and we are so lucky she's with us, albeit not here today, for the year at CDDRL. So Marissa, without further ado. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I have been anticipating my chance at that podium all year and go figure this week, the judge in Florida lifts the mask mandate. My husband flies back from Boston and within 48 hours test positive for COVID. So he's quarantining in the home office and I am coming to you live from my dining room table. <laughs> Um, but anyway, before I begin, I just wanted to thank everyone at CDDRL, including the staff. It is a friendly and engaging place where everyone really truly is dedicated to democracy and development and the rule of law. And so um, thank you for hosting me and um, giving me the opportunity to partake in this uh, collective effort. Um, so let me begin um, by sharing my slides. Um, <clears throat> the work that I'm going to, whoops, sorry. Oh my gosh. One second. We don't want to start with the conclusion. We want to start with the, um, <laughs> beginning. Okay. The work that I'm going to present today is co-authored work with Antonio Benesalio Berlucci. He's a PhD student at Waseda University, and he's writing a dissertation that compares um, the support for populist parties within the EU to the support for populist parties in countries outside of the EU. Um, but our joint work today focuses on the relationship between populism and democratic backsliding. And um, it's tentatively titled, uh, Who's to Blame for Democratic Backsliding? Populists presidents or dominant executives. I'm gonna start of course with uh, Hugo Chavez, who is all three of these things, or was all three of these things, a populist, a president, and a dominant executive. And um, here you can see um, in a news article from the Washington Post in 1998 when he was first elected. And the Post is noting that he is a radical populist. He was elected today in a landslide. And even at that time, um, they note that this creates uncertainty about the future of the nation's 40 year old democracy in Chavez's hands. So our research is motivated by the observation that populist presidents are often very popular. They win elections in landslide electoral victories. Next up is Evo Morales. Um, here, his election uh, is deemed historic and stunning by the CNN. By CNN. Um, and Al Jazeera notes um, a day after his election that he has repeatedly um, said that he will void foreign contracts with foreign companies and uh, nationalize oil and gas. So we also note that um, these uh, popular populist presidents um, are often dominant executives who face um, few institutional checks and weak opposition parties. And the last um, president I'll note um, from Latin America is Rafael Correa. Um, and here is his election in 2006. And note that the Los Angeles Times, um, a few paragraphs down into the article says, like Chavez, he has pledged to make sweeping changes to his nation's corrupt and inefficient political system by convening a new constitutional assembly and concentrating powers in the presidency. So the question, question that motivates us is the following. When backsliding occurs at the hands of populist presidents who are elected in landslide elections, producing dominant executives with few institutional checks and weak opposition parties, should we blame the decline in democracy on their populist ideology, 
their presidential powers, or their party's dominance in the legislature. And the same question can be raised with prime ministers who also win um, support with two thirds majority. So here is uh, Victor Orban and his election in 2010. And he says that voters had carried out a revolution. Another good example is Viktor Orban in 2014, where he says we received a clear and unquestionable mandate to continue what we started. <laughs> and again, in uh, 2018, and most recently, uh, winning another supermajority uh, in 2022. Now, the more precise research question that we ask in this paper is how much backsliding can be attributed to certain causes. And the causes are linked to these, these motivating factors so that we study. So populism, presidentialism, and supermajorities. And I'll explain more in a minute here about why and we, we focus on these particular causes. Um, but first, I just want to point out that this is a slightly different uh, research question than is normally asked um, in studies of backsliding. So most studies of backsliding identify backsliding episodes and then study those episodes. Um, and, and in doing so, they select on the dependent variable. And this informs us about the process by which uh, democratic backsliding unfolds. But um, if we want to assess causal effects, then we really need to study all cases and all potential cases of democratic backsliding. So our strategy for doing so is to collect data on all executives who come to power in democracies, elected democratically or come to power through other means within a, you know, a, a, a democracy. And we collect executives from 1970 to 2020. And then we've merged that with data, um, newly available data on populism. And we use the VDEM measures of democracy. And then we use nearest neighbor matching to assess causal effects. And I'll explain what we do uh, later in the presentation. First, uh, I guess it's important to define what we mean by democratic backsliding. We adopt Nancy Bermeo's often cited definition here, state-led debilitation or elimination of any of the political institutions that sustain an existing democracy. So importantly, we um, are studying uh, democracies to begin with. This is not a study of broader trends in autocratization. And secondly, we are specifically focused on endogenous decay, not the instantaneous collapse of democracy. So we exclude um, coups and self coups from our analysis. We study backsliding up until or prior to the coup, but we don't include any drops in democracy associated with that coup. So really we're studying uh, two features of democratic backsliding that Nancy Bermeo identified, the executive aggrandizement and the electoral manipulation. So for us, democratic backsliding then results in a loss in the quality of liberal democracy. Uh, by liberal democracy, we refer to free and fair elections, the protection of civil liberties, and some legislative and judicial constraints on the executive. So to measure um, democratic backsliding, we calculate it as a percentage drop in liberal democracy. So we, um, we use uh, VDEMs, um, liberal democracy index, and we note the score um, uh, for the liberal democracy index on the date when the executive takes office or um, the date prior to that. And I don't know if Hans Luders is in the audience today, but we take Hans published advice um, to measure democratic backsliding by meaningful um, dates. You know, most studies focus on annual data because that's what's available. Um, but here we use the date when the executive comes to office and the date when the executive leaves office. The tenure of an executive may involve multiple terms in office, but as long as that those are consecutive terms, we consider that one sort of spell. Um, and then in a second uh, unit of analysis, we look at um, executives, legislatures, and majority status, and if um, and use that to define our start and end point. So if the executive changes, if the legislature changes, or the majority status changes, then we consider it a new observation. 
Importantly, when we, when we calculate this, we look at the minimum value before coups or alto golpes. And the reason why we use the percentage um, drop in liberal democracy is because higher initial values give liberal democracy more room to fall before sliding into authoritarianism. So um, to give you an intuitive sense of the measure, um, I'll compare Victor Orban and Hugo Chavez. And actually, both of these guys um, oversaw backsliding of a, of a similar size drop. So, um, let's see. Um, sorry, the, the drops um, for each of them were about 0.3 on this zero to one scale of liberal democracy. So Chavez began at, um, came to office with a liberal democracy score of 0 0.48 and it declines to 0 0.12 uh, during his time in office. And Viktor Orban comes to office with a much higher liberal democracy score of 0 0.68 and it declines to 0 0.37. And so um, similar size drops, but their starting point and their end points are different. And so when we calculate it as a percentage of where they started, Chavez clearly wins as the strongest um, backslider with 75% attributed um, to Chavez and 46% um, occurring under Orban's watch. Okay, um, here's a list of actually the top 20 um, backsliders and you can see Chavez comes out at number one um, and Orban, I think it takes 12th place. So um, if we look at the, the first uh, set of, of leaders on this list, um, Chavez dies in office. Um, Toxin Sinawatra is removed in a military coup. Fujimori uh, ends democracy instantaneously on his own through this alto golpe. Um, and Abdullah Wade in Senegal, I believe, leaves elections uh, due to electoral leaves office due to electoral defeat. So they leave office in different ways, but we think the backsliding that occurs under their watch is comparable because. You can see Fujimori, we're looking at how much backsliding occurs prior to April 5th, 1992, when he does this Alto Gold Bay. And the, um, for Thailand, the measure is also before the, the 2006 coup. Okay, so these uh, are the backsliding backsliders that, that we're all, you know, everyone in that room is familiar with, um, but they're just 20 of the 800, um, more than 800 democratically elected executives in our data set. And so how much backsliding is there really? Um, and we, we know like others, okay, so our measure is different in the sense of we're studying the percentage drop and we're looking at a different unit of analysis than other studies. But we come up to with basically a, a similar sort of conclusion over time democratic backsliding is increasing and it has been doing so, it's been increasing mo uh, rapidly since um, the mid, mid 2000s. So this is a consistent, consistent story. But I think a story that is told less often is that democratic backsliding, although it's widespread, the extreme backsliders can be found in all regions of the world. It's actually, not wide, sorry, sorry, it's, it's, it's um, democratic backsliding is found everywhere, but it is not widespread. And we've drawn a vertical line at 20% uh, to indicate that um, those backsliders that I just showed you are really extreme cases. And most um, democratically elected executives do not see any change in their liberal democracy index or very minimal change. So in this histogram for illustrative purpose, we have excluded the zeros, which represent 45% of our cases, but those zeros are included in our empirical analysis. This is just for, for illustrative purposes. So you can see that um, democratic backsliding um, is, is um, in most cases is, is uh, you know, the liberal democracy score changes only a, a, a small amount. We're not studying positive changes, we're just looking at negative changes. Okay. Now we will turn to um, the causes of backsliding. And 
Um, anyone who's familiar with the literature um, knows that there's widespread concern among scholars about democratic backsliding, but less consensus about what causes it. And we find a, a wide range of theories proposed in the literature. Many of them are untested. And I think some of these can be tested now with, with the available data. Others, I think, verge on tautology and, and aren't subject, uh, can't be tested um, in this way. Um, but the range of explanations um, you know, goes from actor-centered explanations to structural explanations. And um, today what we're, we're looking at um, three primary um, causes of democratic backsliding that fall somewhere in between individuals and structures. So the first uh, factor that we look at is ideology. And um, we argue that populism offers ideological justification. We don't mean to say that populism mandates a democratic backsliding, but scholars generally agree that there's a tension between populism and liberal democracy. Populism uh, emphasizes the um, general will, and this sort of worldview contrasts with the pluralist foundations of liberal democracy. And it also comes into conflict with the representative institutions and checks and balances, which from the populist perspective could be seen as an impediment to the general will. And one of the interesting things that we get from, from looking at the data is that about 30% of democratically elected executives today um, subscribe to a populist ideology. So this in itself, I think, is, is surprising. This measure of populism is based on the V, uh, v party measure of populism. It's an index um, that studies, um, that looks at two components, anti-elitism and people centrism. Um, we dichotomize it at 0 0.5 and it's, the, the V party um, codes political parties and we attribute executives to the score, we get attributes executive scores to their parties or the other way around. Um, but we also use other sources. So I'll note that this second uh, source, the vote for populists is an in-house production, um, part of the global populism report that was put together by uh, senior fellows at CDDRL. And um, the, uh, the data set can be whoops, downloaded um, from the FSI website, which was put together by Anna GB and Mike McFall. Okay, so the vote for populist data set is nice because it codes both, both leaders and their parties, and it adopts a similar definition of populism, which emphasizes the sort of corrupt elites versus the general will of the people. Uh, and we also have this other measure um, of the global populism database. Um, it's not quite as extensive, but we use it to supplement um, the others. And uh, the global populism database focuses just on leaders. So we combine it with the votes for populists to get a measure that specifically focuses on leaders rather than their parties. But apart from you know, these different um, sort of availability and ways of measuring populism, we really see a similar pattern across all measures. And so what these graphs are showing is the average percentage drop in um, the liberal democracy index under populists and non-populists. And you can see that populists, the drop is about six to 10%, depending on the measure. Whereas for non-populists, it hovers around two or 3%. Okay, the second um, factor that we consider is, um, popular election. And here we're referring to presidents elected um, in presidential systems or presidents in the presidential premier version of semi-presidentialism. And we, we go back to the perils of presidentialism, particularly the emphasis on the personalization of politics um, and possibly the election of outsiders. Um, we, we also rely on um, a large body of research that focuses on the differences in the accountability relationships between um, presidential systems and um, parliamentary systems. In particular, research that shows that um, 
the accountability relationships differ not just between the branches, but also intra-party accountability differs. So presidents usually are not removed by their own party, whereas prime ministers sometimes are through a vote of no confidence procedure. Um, <clears throat> So, but we have seen um, a growing increase in presidential interruptions where presidents are impeached or otherwise removed midstream. Um, and so there's uh, presidents have this uh, strong sort of incentive to protect that themselves and their power vis-a-vis -vis other branches of government. Um, and we expect that presidents will sort of take advantage of their personal sort of plebiscitarian legitimacy uh, in, in seizing, grabbing power from others. Um, so here we see the um, same sort of graph. Uh, the presidents are on the right, the two bars on the right, prime ministers, the two bars on the left. Whether or not they're populist, we see that uh, presidents tend to, um, we see more backsliding under presidents than under prime ministers. Um, Okay, finally, um, we uh, argue that super majorities provide the institutional means. And we focus on super majorities because most constitutions um, specify um, two thirds support for revisions. And once a government obtains that two thirds, uh, then minorities pretty much, minority interests lose their, their protections. Also, previous research has shown that um, when presidents, for example, control large majorities um, in the legislature, they can use that control to um, seize control of the judiciary or other oversight um, agencies of the state. So um, <clears throat> we show here um, that, you know, there is more backsliding on average under supermajorities or executives with supermajorities than under executives with less support. So other scholars have noted that backsliders need the motive, the opportunity, and uh, the means, right, um, to backslide. And we think each one of these sort of checks those boxes respectively. But another way of framing this is as different versions of the question, like, should I attack democracy? May I attack democracy? And can I attack democracy? Okay. Um, so far, what I've been showing you is just descriptive data. Um, and now I'm going to show you our empirical analysis. Um, but before I get to the results on the next slide, I just wanna um, point out what does not cause democratic backsliding in our view. So um, probably the, um, the most common um, explanation in my reading of the literature is the, um, uh, the initial level of democracy. So weak democracies to begin with are more vulnerable to backsliding. And while this may be true, um, we are, our goal here is to look for causes that are independent of the starting point. I mean, our measure takes into account the initial level of democracy. And in our analysis, as you'll see, we also um, take into account uh, the ex democratic experience. But um, it's sort of more intuitively appealing uh, to us to look for a cause of democratic backsliding that could apply to any executive elected uh, in, in democracies. Um, the second um, uh, point here is that things like power struggles or stealth or incrementalism for us um, define backsliding. They are how backsliding unfolds, but um, they are not um, causes of democratic backsliding. Um, per se. We're interested in the causes of declines in liberal democracy, um, not sort of how it goes about declining. Um, likewise, we, um, we um, do not study the, the pace of decline in democracy. So it might be true that like uh, the more executive aggrandizing you do today, the easier it is to backslide tomorrow. And I think that it'd be interesting to study and um, something I want to look at, you know, the, the, the pattern of backsliding over the course of, of 
uh, leader's tenure in office. But here we're interested in the causes of decline, not the pace of change or how that pace changes over time. And finally, um, we do not uh, take as causes any of the any variables that may have been affected by these treatments that we're interested in here. And the important example here is political polarization. So we often hear that political polarization causes democratic backsliding. But at the same time, scholars who study democratic backsliding point to the polarization as a strategy. Larry Diamond has said that um, executive uh, you know, engrodizers or the autocratic leaders are generators of polarization. So we're not going to include political polarization as um, a cause in, in our analysis. Okay. Um, so here are our hypotheses. Um, all else equal, there will be more democratic backsliding during populist executives' tenures in office than during non-populist executives' tenures in office. And we do the same for president as chief executives as compared to prime ministers as chief executives. And we hypothesize again the similar thing, but with dominant executives um, with super majorities as compared to non-dominant executives who have less support. Okay, we purport the average treatment effect on the treated. And what this is measuring is essentially comparing the amount of backsliding that occurs under a populist executive, let's say, comparing that to the amount of, of backsliding that would occur if those executives were not populist, but otherwise exactly the same. Okay? And so we do this by matching each populist to a non-populist, and we exact match when we're studying the populist treatment, we exact match on presidents and dominant executives. When we're looking at presidents as the treatment, we exact match on populists and dominant executives and so on. In all three cases, for all three treatments, we also um, use nearest neighbor matching on three important background factors. So first, the size of the population, um, so that we're not comparing, say, microstates to megastates. Um, democratic stock. Democratic stock is a measure of the cumulative experience with democracy um, and the level of democracy up until the point at which the executive takes office. So um, it, the um, democratic stock is correlated with uh, GDP per capita, which, you know, we can replace it and get similar results. It's also correlated with the initial liberal democracy index score. Again, uh, we can replace it with similar scores, but democratic stock is nice because it measures the cumulative experience with democracy in that country up until the point at which the executive takes office. Um, also, we study, economic, we use economic growth as a indicator of the sort of uh, state of the economy. Um, and these are measured in the year prior to the executive uh, coming to office. Okay. So for example, um, here are some of the matches that uh, Stata puts together for us. And I, there's nothing systematic about you know, this particular list. I just pulled uh, some examples to give you kind of a sense of what it's doing. Um, and you can see that, for example, Christina Kirshner in Argentina is matched with uh, Bachelet in Chile, Christina being a populist president without a supermajority and Bachelet being a non-populist president without a supermajority. And sometimes, um, you know, you see um, interesting matches like uh, Thailand, you know, Shinawatra being matched with the first uh, prime minister Suarez in, in Spain after the return to democracy. Um, sometimes executives, if you look down to where populist using the leaders themselves, um, here you can see that Sometimes leaders are matched with a previous leader within the same country. Um, so Bolsonaro versus Lula or Duterte versus Aquino. Um, and then going down, you can see the presidents are matched um, with prime ministers and uh, the executives who have super majorities are matched with ex similar executives who don't. So um, non-populist uh, say um, matched with non-populist or populist with a super majority matched with a populist without a super majority. Okay, so 
here finally are our results. So uh, we find a positive and statistically significant effect for populism and also for supermajorities, um, but not for presidents. And on average, uh, our results show that um, populists cause a drop of up to 7% more than non-populists. And actually, this is a pretty substantial finding given the fact that in this data set, the average uh, percentage drop in liberal democracy is uh, just 3.3 um, uh, points with a standard deviation of 8.8. .8. These graphs show that we obtain covariate balance. Um, so before matching in the raw data, there is a difference between populist and non-populist, let's say. So in the treatment in the control group. So populists tend to be elected where democratic stock is lower. Okay? And so the, the, on the left side of the graph, you see um, these differences as absolute values, um, standardized differences. But once we do the matching, the differences are negligible between the treatment group and uh, the control group. We did the same analysis using this different unit of analysis. Here are all three measures of populism are significant. Supermajority is significant at the 0 0.1 um, level. And again, presidents um, are no longer significant. Here, the magnitude of the effect is, is smaller, but it's still important. Um, it makes sense because in this version of the data set, the average um, drop is just 2.4%. Okay. We also, uh, ran a um, regular regression using these variables as control variables. We use a Poisson regression with robust standard errors clustered by executives. We use the Poisson regression because of the distribution of our dependent variable. We have this skewed data set with, um, with many meaningful zeros. Um, and we find a similar size effect. Um, for populism here, it's uh, the average marginal effect on the predicted drop is about, for populists is about, you know, 2%. And if we look back here on this VDEM measure um, or V party measure, it was also about 2%. Anyone interested in stargazing, here's the models, um, just to show you that whether we use um, VDEM or the vote for populists or the leaders measure, we obtain significant results. Um, you can see that democratic stock is statistically significant and negative, right? So experience with democracy um, makes for, um, does in fact, you know, reduce the um, uh, size of the drop. Um, we replace it with GDP per capita or um, the initial, just the liberal democracy score, the initial liberal democracy score, and it doesn't really affect our findings. Over here in column six, um, for fun, we actually do include political polarization, uh, also economic globalization, um, anti-system civil society movements, and the percentage of the territory that is controlled by um, the state, um, you know, over which the state has authority. These indicators are also statistically significant, but they don't seem to affect our, our main findings. Okay, so to conclude, um, <clears throat> we find that there is more backsliding on average under populists and also under executives who command super majorities. However, popularly elected chief executives do not differ from prime ministers in the extent of backsliding that occurs on their watch. Now, these findings probably aren't that surprising, uh, but I um, think they help put things in context because, whoops, um, the backsliding of Orban and Chavez um, goes much beyond the typical populist in power. So if we want to understand those extreme cases, we need to look deeper it's not just because they're populists and it's not just because they have super majorities, right? Um, and so I think more generally, the um, our study is, is helpful for putting backsliding in context. Yes, we do see these extreme cases, but it's important that we put them in context of a larger pattern where backsliding um, is happening, it's increasing, but it's not, it's not 
it's still not widespread. Um, but in terms of the causes of the backsliding that does occur, um, we would say that ideology is more powerful than institutions or that ill intentions are more powerful than institutional assets. So thank you very much um, for your attention and I um, open it up now to, to questions and comments. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marissa, for that really interesting presentation. If anyone has questions, please let me know aggressively. All right, Eric and Sean, um, but I'll start. So this is great. And I was one of the authors of that FSI Global Populism Report. And I think that at the time, um, you know, one thing that we struggled with is that populism is itself sort of a thin ideology. It's more like a set of rhetorical strategies. Um, and my question for you is sort of the distribution of populism as an ideology over time. So I am totally convinced that backsliding is a recent phenomenon in your like sort of 60 year span of your data or 50 year. On, and then, you know, presidentialism and maybe even supermajorities are sort of constant in that time. But do you find that the existence of populist ideology is also something that is more prevalent in the 21st century? Um, and then we'll go down the list from there. Yes. Um, populism, um, according to these measures, has increased. Um, so, it I, there was a graph I could show you, but you know it starts. Um, it's now up to thirty percent in the last two decades. Oh, sorry, I thought I remembered that as a backsliding yeah. graph. So then, do you have yeah. any sense of why that's the case? Um, no, <laughs> I mean yes, but not um, nothing uh, that I can. Um, you know, verify empirically, but, you know, my, my own intuition is, and there's been a lot of research and study, you know, globalization and um, the um, insecurity of jobs and the increasing, my, you know, migration and all the things that we know, you know, um, to be attributed or have been proposed as part of the cause of of populism, then our background conditions here, right, and those factors are increasing the election of populists to power, and then the populists to power are leading to the backsliding that we're studying. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. All right, so I have Eric, Hisham, and then Dinsha, and then two others. Marissa, thank you for this. I'm going to ask you an unfair question. Okay. Uh, and ask you to think prescriptively. So uh, imagine that you're called uh, by country X to advise on uh, an institutional design to avoid this problem. Um, and your your last comment was ill intentions are more important than institutional design. And that's what prompted me to ask you, what would you do in institutional design? I, I suppose you would try to propagate a number of parties uh, that are strong to avoid supermajority effects. But what else would you advise? Right. It's a good question. I mean, I'm somebody who studied political institutions for a long time. So for me, uh, it's a little bit disappointing that we can't find an institutional fix uh, to this problem. Um, but yes, I think that strong party systems is obviously really important. Opposition, strong opposition parties. Um, and, uh, you know, I think then we, the, our results support the sort of Levitsky and Way idea that you know we need um, forbearance and um, mutual respect, right? And that it comes down to parties um, controlling who gets elected um, in the first place. So um, there isn't an inst I mean, uh, there isn't much of an institutional fix. Um, electoral systems that don't produce supermajorities would be great, um, but these are popular presidents. They win in the beginning, they come to office, some of them, um, with landslide electoral victories. So um, the, the, sadly, I don't think there is a clear institutional fix. Sean? Marissa, thank you very much for a uh, very, very fascinating paper and presentation, uh, which is very engaging. My question for you is, so the, the three hypotheses that you're currently testing Populism, uh, presidentialism, and uh, supermajority. So, in say like elections or socio uh, political diversity, institutions, and ideology. And my question for you I mean, I, I really like the paper and I really like the 
matching techniques and how that kind of overcomes the, the issue of functional form and, and, and such. But my question is, why, why do we assume ex ante that these are competing or these are alternative hypotheses that are competing and that are not complementary uh, or perhaps competing and not mutually exclusive? So I'm wondering, like, you know, why can't we say that perhaps uh, presidentialism is in fact a significant factor only under conditions when you have supermajorities or presidentialism is operable only when you have uh, presidentialism. In more kind of uh, practical terms, I'm wondering if you try, you know, in the Poisson regression, if you tried any interactions between these variables and whether any interesting um, trends came up. Thank you. Yes. Um, so we've considered um, whether we should run sort of interactions, presidents with supermajorities, presidents without supermajorities. Um, I actually think that um, Antonio did look into presidents with supermajorities and presidents without and didn't find uh, it still wasn't wasn't a significant effect. But I see these as additive. So, you know, if you're uh, a populist, uh, you're predicted to sort of, you know, uh, oversee a decline in democracy of let's say 7%. If you also have a supermajority, that would be another um, uh, two points, right? So I, I think of these as additive, not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, but yes, we can, we can run um, interactions um, and look to see if presidents with supermajorities are particularly, um, you know, uh, dangerous for, for backsliding. I did think, you know, initially we see that there is on average, if you just look at presidents um, and not presidents, right, there is a lot of back, more backsliding under presidents than under um, prime ministers. But I, um, our results, um, if anything, they, they show sort of, they tend towards the negative side um, so, um, it seems as though, you know, populists are presidents, presidential systems are more likely to elect populists, uh, but not necessarily, um, that it's the presidential system itself, but rather the populists, uh, part of it that, that causes the backsliding. All right, Jinsha. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. This might be a little bit of a naive question, so I apologize for that, but, uh, it seems there might be some just help me understand the definitions a little bit more of the terms you're using. So populism, at least the way you laid it out as an ideology, seems like you'd be getting a political leader that would be against a lot of aspects of liberal democracy, maybe not electoral institutions, but certainly when you're talking about breaking down other kinds of institutions, majority rule, those kinds of things, they would be going against liberal democracy. So, excuse me. <clears throat> So what are we seeing here that should be surprising? We've got a very powerful political actor that's against liberal democracy when that person comes in uh, and is, lo and behold, somewhat successful at that process. Uh, is there something that I'm missing? Should we be separating liberal from democracy or, or thinking about it in some other way? No, I, I agree that it's not so much surprising <clears throat> that we see democratic backsliding under um, populists, um, but not all populists, um, you know, um, are equivalent to Victor Orban and Hugo Chavez. So um, yes, we see democratic backsliding under populists, but it's not um, at an extreme level. Um, it doesn't have to be. Um, so I think it helps put that, um, you know, the populist factor in context. Populism is, populists are sort of coming in with an ideology that is in tension with liberal democracy. And it's not so surprising that then they um, attack liberal democracy. And we saw in those news articles that they, they said they were gonna do this from the very beginning and voters supported that, right? They, they got elected and that was their intention all along. So um, in that aspect, I don't think it's, it's so much surprising, um, but they, um, but, but it's not, um, but it doesn't account for the full sort of, you know, um, the, the extreme levels of backsliding that we see on, in some 
in so, under some of these uh, cases, which we might say, oh, he's just a populist. Chavez was a populist. That's why Democrat was, Orban's a populist. And so he doesn't support respect liberal democracy. And that's why it declines. And that is part of the story, but it's obviously not the only thing. Um, I have Brett and Hans, and then we have Alberto on the, <laughs> and a few others in the room. Yes, I have you, you two next. All right, so Brett. Great, thank you. Um, and Marissa, thanks so much for the uh, presentation, which I really enjoyed. I'm keen to read the paper as well. So uh, four quick comments. Um, first, can you, can you go back to the top 20 um, uh, you know, most egregious backsliders? Yep. Thank you. Do you want to ask something in the meantime? Sure. Um, all right, so, um, so, so I noticed um, that, um, okay, right. So, so I noticed that, you know, you rank Abdullah Wad fourth, substantially head of, um, of Niger. And by the way, Umaru was the prime minister. Mamadou Tanjo was the president. And so, um, like he, Tanj is generally considered the one who kind of engineered um, the, the third term. All right, so so Wad, I mean, ultimately competed in kind of the third term presidential election, um, but he stepped down, um, whereas Tanja um, basically like ignored the end of his mandate and ultimately was removed two years after the mandate ended by the military. All right, so the, like, I'm just guessing that the only way like ranking Wad above Tanja would make sense is because you're standardizing by the initial liberal democracy index, right? And so, I, like, I'm, so I'm just guessing that Senegal had a higher initial score than Niger, but I mean, it's, I don't know, it's kind of weird to think just sort of knowing the two cases that, that Senegal was more egregious. So I'm just curious um, if by not standardizing, the results um, would, be, would be any different. Second, um, I mean, the, the exact matching, um, I mean, I, I guess I would kind of tone back the causal language since you're still just matching on observed covariates and some of the matches like are themselves, you know, like kind of odd, right? Um, in particular, you know, Mackie saw the current Senate who's president with um, Horn, uh, the Hungarian one. Um, so then third and fourth, I was just thinking about, you know, other covariates that might potentially be interesting. Um, I can imagine that, you know, a uh, point in, you know, in one's presidential term would be, I mean, certainly, you know, certainly, you know, across the African continent would be the time when uh, backsliding occurs. Um, that was certainly the case for both Wad and for Niger. So I'm curious um, what, uh, what effect, including, um, you know, kind of, a, you know, how long or, how, you know, how many sort of uh, days until, um, kind of the, the election, which would presumably limit the person's uh, uh, term limit or remove the person from office. And then fourth, um, you mentioned, I think, that um, you didn't think that previous backsliding could be a cause of future backsliding. But I mean, that kind of seems, I don't know, I, I can imagine, you know, uh, sort of previous experiences of backsliding could condition contemporary expectations about you know what might be acceptable and so in that sense sort of facilitate um, backsliding in the future. Great. Okay, so um, these two um, uh, leaders in Senate Niger and Senegal aren't that different here, right? Um, and uh, we debated um, whether to look at the net score or the, the drop, right? So the net score being the start to the end point. And instead we are looking at the start to the, the minimum score. So I suspect that at some point Senegal goes back up with the elections, right? And so we're looking at the lowest point of democracy on their watch. Um, but probably for those guys who leave office, there's it, it swings back up with, with the election, right? So, um, that was a under that, under that reasoning, Wad should have, since he ultimately competed in the election, right? Like presumably, <clears throat> um, like that argument would have made his score, sorry, his drop lower. You know, so That's I'm right. just kind of wondering if, if the standardization is actually kind of like, like conditioning your index in some kind of way that may not be like really consistent with. The yeah, I don't think. I mean. Um, the condition, the standardization, the starting like as a percentage of where they started is one thing, but also the fact that we're looking at their minimum score, not the end point. Okay, so probably at some point and during his presidency, 
um, uh, Abdullah Awad, the, the score was, you know, dropped by, um, I don't know how many points what the drop is, right? It's as a, as a percentage of, of the initial score here. But, um, but yeah, we can, we can also do that. We can also study the, the drop in itself rather than as a reflective of, as a share of where they started. That's another way to do this. Um, and in fact, with, you know, we started with all these different types of measures and have consolidated down to the percentage drop because it was kind of a nice way of bringing it all together. Um, but there are different ways of measuring the dependent variable. And so that would of course produce different results. Um, and that might be, might be useful for adding to the paper. Um, the other thing you mentioned was um, the difference between presidents and prime ministers. We've struggled with this a little bit in um, the semi-presidential systems. And so we're using other researchers measures of distinguishing presidential parliamentary systems from premier presidential. And the premier presidential, previous research has shown, operate a lot like, you know, and, and in terms of um, quality of democracy and things like that are more like, uh, parliamentary systems and the president parliamentary versions are more like presidential systems. So that was our distinction. Um, so we look at presidents in Senegal and prime ministers in Niger, but, um, you know, um, we've debated that particularly um, with the African cases uh, where it's quite common, the semi-presidential system. So if you think we should be looking at presidents um, in all of the semi-presidential systems, um, I would I would be open to that advice. Definitely for Niger. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and as far as time, you know, when it occurs, um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. It's not, um, you know, we, I read um, Anna GB's, uh, I think it's called Time Will Tell, um, but a really interesting, I forget what it's called, but it's a really interesting, um, you know, take on the different ways in which we associate the study of time um, in comparative politics and, um, you know, I think the pace of change and um, you know the how the pace changes over time, super interesting. Just not what we're studying um, in this paper. Um, and uh, same goes for um, you know previous previous backsliding. So previous backsliding um, might um, make it easier to do more backsliding. But, um, you know, some of these guys are in office for a short time, some are in long time, and they all, you know, if they're, if they're motivated, uh, have the opportunity and the means, um, backsliding doesn't necessarily have to take a long time. Um, and so, um, here we're sort of agnostic to the, to the time part of it, but I think in another study, I would like to study how it changes over time. So those are all um, good points uh, that I would like to either incorporate in this paper or do in another uh, separate, separate analysis. So in the interest of time, we will try to group two sets of two questions from here. So Hans and Alberto, who's online, and then we'll conclude with Johannes and I too. All right, so Hans. Great, um, thank you, Marissa. I thought this was really interesting and um, yeah, I think, I mean, this is obviously like a really difficult and important question to study this. Right. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that you like using kind of like, you know, a new and innovative approach to like um, answer this really difficult question. So I have like uh, one question and two suggestions, I guess. Um, my, my one question is about kind of like how we think about electoral dominance. This is really confusing. I'm just going to look at the screen. <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, your measure of electoral dominance is like, you know, is there a super majority? But I'm wondering if, um, because like, and I think if I remember correctly, your um, justification for that is like, to what extent can we uh, change the constitution or something? But I'm wondering if, um, like backsliding is really necessarily at the beginning about changing constitutions or like, you know, changing electoral law or something for which you might not need an, um, a super majority, but maybe just like an absolute majority, an absolute majority like controlled by one party. So I'm wondering whether like you would actually have stronger effects if you also look into like uh, coalition government in parliament or cohabitation in um, like presidential systems versus simple majority held by one party versus super majorities. And I would be curious to see like what the results are here. And then my kind of like, Small suggestions uh, on the matching. I was wondering if you might want to include some sort of like year or time or decade or something. I think there was like one match that, um, sorry that I'm bringing this up, but um, it's, I think like 
to Germany in the early 80s was matched to Berlusconi in the 19, early 90s, but obviously like the international environment had changed quite dramatically between the 80s and 90s. And I'm wondering if you might want to uh, account for that. And then my other question is about, so you have like, on, on like the measurement of the dependent variables, so obviously you have a lot of zeros, which is good because obviously backsliding <laughs> thankfully doesn't happen everywhere. But I'm wondering if like, um, it actually makes sense to almost like look at this like continuously or whether you want to like look at some sort of like two-stage process where, whereby first you look at whether backsliding occurs or not and there you can account for all the zeros that you have and then conditional on backsliding occurring, occurring whether like how you can predict the magnitude of change. Hmm. Um, and then Alberto's like, questions are, um, are well, I won't say more. Uh, so he has a question on matching, which is um, always done on observables. Why didn't you include other variables like contiguity or GDP per capita? And on populism, is it possible that initially the first election isn't really backsliding, but a strengthening of democracy sometimes when populist leaders bring previously excluded groups or voters into the electoral process? Okay, great. Um both good comments. Um, so yeah, majorities and coalitions, here we are looking at coalitions. Um, it's very hard to study um, and assess you know, the majority status for all these governments all over the world, but we've done our best to assess um, their, the size of their coalition. We did look at majorities and minorities um, separately. Um, potentially thought, you know, maybe minority governments, presidents with minorities have more incentive to backslide because they're frustrated by uh, Congress, which, but um, the results, if I re remember, um, really are just hold for super majorities. Um, I think your point about controlling for um, some decade dummy or something like that, looking at, at time might, might make sense. Um, yeah. Um, you know, in these matching models, normally people don't match on too many um, factors. And so the more matches we, more things we include, the more harder it is to achieve balance and that sort of thing. But I can see your point that um, the environment has changed um, over time. And so that might be an important um, background factor to, to care for. And um, yeah, um, Albert is right um, that, you know, um, we don't, we don't match on the GDP per capita because it's really highly correlated with the democratic stock, but we've tried replacing democratic stock with GDP per capita and the results are the same. I think populists might be seen, and there's definitely um, arguments that we cite in the paper about the um, populism being a corrective to democracy and improving democracy. And maybe that's part of the reason why we don't assess that populism has this huge effect, right? It's, it's uh, on average, the effect is a 7% drop, but it doesn't account for the large scale drop. So it might be that democracy improves initially um, and that, um, you know, the drops that we're seeing come later. So um, based on these various comments, I think there is a demand for a study that looks at when backsliding occurs uh, uh, over the course of the term. Thanks. All right, final two questions, Johannes, and then I do. Thank you very much for this presentation. I have maybe a naive question. And, and then as we have seen in, in Europe, in the case of Hungary and also Italy, that a key factor, I think, uh, played an important role was the performance of the previous governments, the democratic governments. And my question to you is, and that in, in our experience, maybe more political experience in, in Europe, this is the, the um, what is that, outstanding importance, you know. So did you take that somehow into account? Or is that, I mean, all one cannot be explained, in, in my view, you know, in experience. I was working in the government at that time without having seen the really very bad performance of the preceding democratic governments. And that is explained so without having this bad performance, I think it would be difficult to imagine, um, I think, what Orban did later on. The same is in Italy, this very important. So could you say, is that yeah. something to take into account? And then, yeah, I, and then oh, okay. uh, yeah, I do. I just want to uh, ask you about polarization. I mean, the, like, the reason why you don't take polarization into account can also be said for populism, right? Because they also increase the level of populism when they are doing the, when, they are undertaking the uh, democratic backsliding. So I think when you take polarization into account at the beginning of the tenure of the backslider, I think that might be that might make the paper even more interesting because then I mean the current independent variables that you are using are very agency based or the institution that like 
carves out some room for the agency of the president or the executive. But then you can argue that like, if you use polarization, it's more like a social or like more a structural uh, determinant of uh, of bad democratic backsliding. So maybe I would just like suggest that you, you should use polarization, especially since you also have the variable there as an independent alternative explanation. So. Okay, great. Um, yeah, both both questions. Um, the previous government performance and the extent of polarization prior to the executive taking office. So the um, previous government performance, we don't include performance per se, but we do take into account the state of democracy before, but that's obviously different from government performance. So I think um, that's a good point. Um, one of the things I did notice is that pop, um, backsliders, there are, we do see repeated cases of backsliding in some countries, like under one executive and then later on under another. Um, so there might be some, um, you know, effect of previous uh, backsliding as well. So previous government performance and previous backsliding might help us understand backsliding. These are good ideas. And then as far as polarization goes, yeah, um, you know, initially, um, uh, the problem with you know, polarization and populism, I don't think can be studied, can be separated um, because um, populists create polarization, polarization maybe supports the rise of populism. So maybe I can look at them um, separately and um, show that polarization uh, at the time when the executive comes to office also is an cause of subsequent democratic backsliding. But I don't think I can do both at the same time um, because the balance just gets, um, it's just, it's, it's um, yeah, it's hard to obtain the balance. But um, I would also say that yes, populists um, both, I think create polarization um, as a strategy to help them in justifying their moves. But I also think, yes, populist, you know, the polarization in society probably exists some before that leads to their, their. so I, I, I see your point and um, maybe we can do that as a separate analysis. Thank you. Marissa, we, um, we miss you yeah. and we will see you very soon, we hope. But thank, thank you. you so much for this fantastic presentation. Thank you everyone for coming today and we'll see you soon. Thanks, thank you so much.